you ready for this? Welcome back. We're running on one brain cell. Between the two of us. Welcome if back that. to the matinee, Kate. Between the two of us. <laughs> Welcome back. It's between the two of us and Nugget. <laughs> Nugget's got most of it. So today's case, if you follow us on social media, you would already know, is the case on Marvin Hemeyer. It is most commonly known as the Killdozer case, but I'm not going to be calling it Killdozer a lot throughout this. I know you're going to be calling it Killdozer <laughs> a lot, though, so... Any time that Kate says Killdozer in this recording, I am going to voice over it with some, like, really weird monotone. Just I to... feel like I'm being shunned. Well, <laughs> I do the editing so I can have as much fun as I want. We're going to make Penny laugh so much. We are going to. I'm going to leave all this in just for you, Penny. <laughs> just for you. So today's case is on Marvin Hemeyer mm-hmm. and his, we'll say, battle against the town his of, crusade his crusade <laughs> against the town of granby colorado i'm gonna start with just a really brief kind of overgoing of like his history and how he ended mm-hmm. up there in the first place marvin also known as marv john Hemeyer, was born in 1951 on a dairy farm in south dakota he joined the air force and over the course of his career in the air force he ended up getting stationed in colorado and he just kind of fell in love with the mountains and he's like you know what i want to live there teddy's uncle who's in the air force is stationed in colorado okay um marv was at lowry air force base uh whichever one is close he was kind of in colorado the... springs is the one that okay my... uh well marv spent a lot uncle of his time in the denver boulder area Denver slash Boulder area. They're close. They're they really are. close. They it's it's like a string of Pretty cities, much. essentially. Pretty much. But he fell in love with living by the mountains, and he ended up really picking up a knack for welding and working on motors mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So while he was living in that area, he was working in muffler shops for a while, and after doing it for a while and moving up the ranks and getting really, really good at it, he was just like, you know what? I think I can do this on my own. So he ended up opening up a few shops of his own, and life was good, and everything was going awesome for him. Mm-hmm. And he there's was... a big car community up there too. Yeah. So it, like it, it's a really well-paying industry if you can actually, you know, get the footing right. Mm-hmm. And he was, he was just, he was really good at what he did. Mm-hmm. He was a really likable guy, and. I forgot to mention this at the beginning. Throughout the course of this, I am going to be putting some audio clips in here. Um, Marv, prior to everything that happened with his Komatsu bulldozer, he recorded a set of cassette tapes, audio tapes. Mm-hmm. And these tapes are readily available online if you search up Hemeyer tape recordings. You can you can find them online. You can listen to them online. You can download them free online. I right. have them. It's kind of like his manifesto. <laughs> kind of. It's it's actually described a little bit like a manifesto mm-hmm. by a lot of people. It, it, they kind of use it with anyone that goes. I'm just gonna say on a spree of any kind, whether right. you know whether it's lethal or mm-hmm. not. They usually most of the time they like to document what they're gonna do or what they've done and everything like that and it really does kind of end up in these manifestos the crazy thing is is with marv these tapes were only made because it was suggested to him (laughs) and i don't think that they knew that he was going to be doing what he was doing when they suggested it to him i it was a friend of his that was was like hey probably a therapy thing that they're like hey maybe do this like it might help (laughs) It'll come out a bit more Mm -hmm. as I tell the story, but the friend of his that told him to make the tapes, I think, was kind of doing it in a, hey, you know, if you get this story, like, down, like, it'll be there, like, people will know what what happened kind of thing. Even if, there's a lot of, there's just, there's a lot. That's why I struggled with my notes on Mm -hmm. this, and ultimately why I'm just kind of going from, I've I've got the brain cell right now. (laughs) Like I said, Marv ultimately fell in love with the mountains. He wanted mm. to stay in the Colorado area. He it's did a everything. beautiful area. It is a beautiful area. He did everything that he did with the other muffler shops. He started mm-hmm. his own muffler shops in the in the um, Boulder, Denver area. Yeah. And he ended up kind of like, I guess technically selling the shops. He, he goes into it a bit more in depth in the tapes and feel free to listen to those. I might throw some of that information in just kind of randomly throughout this episode. Mm-hmm. After he had kind of gotten rid of those shops, he kind of came up towards the Grand Lake, Colorado area, which is, I believe they said, like 16 miles from Granby. 
And he ended up being like, you know what? This is where I want to be. This is where I want to stay. I should find some property out here. So he found right. a decent little chunk of property with a couple of cabins on it. And it had a really nice hot tub out on a, out on a deck. So he had this, this beautiful view of what he described as God's country. Life was good. And everything was awesome, and he was totally happy. He ended up actually moving up there or to that area in 1989, okay. and he became very well known in that area as the snowmobile guy. He would custom make bumpers for people's snowmobiles so that they could go off trail and go out in the woods and oh, run trees over and not have to worry rigs about and stuff like that too. I'm not sure how much fishing he did, but he was described as being pretty much addicted to his snowmobiling. A lot of people <laughs> said that everything that he did for work was to just fund his snowmobiling habits. So <laughs> they they had a group that they called, I believe it was the Thursday group. It was just a bunch of guys that would go out and go snowmobiling every Thursday, all winter long. Most of them were older, but there was one, I can't remember his name, but there was one guy in the group that was 16 when he started riding with them. And he kind of looked up to Marv as like yeah. a father figure in this way because Marv taught him a whole lot of stuff about snowmobiles and making stuff. And and back then they were like, because the 80s it was around like when this was happening? Uh, Early 90s, mid. 89 was when he moved to Grand Lake, so I'd probably say like, end of 89 into oh, 1990 man, dude, the sleds in ni- the 90s were fun they were the good ones yeah we have a 93 well i say we it's true's all the I ones have, i all have the ones that we've to had. a 93 <laughs> <laughs> all the ones that we've had have been from the 90s i think the one that we have now is a 2004 but like they weren't basically from 90 until like 2005 they weren't that really fucking different but they're, right they're fun some of them really go oh yeah Oh yeah, I've I've gone fast enough to be fucking terrified. Dude, our formula trying to keep up with Drew. <laughs> if you go to like eighty, eighty on a snowmobile is terrifying. Eighty on anything where you're not contained is terrifying for me. Yeah, yeah. I think I topped out at maybe forty, but I don't know because the speedometer hasn't worked in over a decade. Yeah, dude, that's what happened <laughs> with our, our summit. I think our summit was a ninety-seven. In. I believe it was the end of ninety-one. Basically, ninety-one into ninety-two. He mm. was like, "Well, I gotta." I got to just kind of kind of figure out something to do in the area. I mean, he had his hobbies with his snowmobiles and everything else, but he was trying to just find a way to, like, make money a little bit. So he Set ended some up, roots, probably. Yeah, and what he ended up doing was he found this decent property in Granby. It was on two acres with a little machine shop garage-looking thing, and he was actually, according to his tapes, he was finding it because a buddy of his was trying to set up an auto shop, mm. and he was his thought was he would go to the auction. It was a foreclosure auction. Right. His thought was he would go to the auction, purchase the property, and then turn around and lease it, finance it, whatever, to that friend until that money was made back kind of thing, plus a little bit for his purchase of it. He called me and said he was looking for a place up here to start a garage. And uh, he already owned a cabin up here, up there on Cobb County Road 4. And uh, I said, I'd take a look, see if I could find anything. And then I happened to cross a piece of property down there in Granby. It was an old concrete plant, and the guy had gone bankrupt and uh, had, had an auction and, you know, gotten rid of all his stuff he had and left a bunch of junk there. It's my understanding. And, uh, but it had a... 3,000 square foot building with three bay doors that were huge. I mean, it was a great, great building. It wasn't the best location, but it was a good building and had two acres of ground. And uh, I talked to him about it and he said that'd be great. I think he even came up and looked at it. I can't remember. But anyway, he, he said that he was interested. And ultimately, Which not a bad plan. Ultimately, the thing about this property is um, the septic system on the property was literally just like a concrete basin that everything would just kind of into it was under the ground but it was it was an older property right it was not actually a part of the township at that point it was technically a county land yeah. sort of situation and and all of this is at the time of the purchase let me explain a bit about granby real quick so granby is it's a lot like our town and mm-hmm. it's it's a smaller area at the time population was around 2000 about the same as what we have here a little bit bigger and <laughs> In a lot of small towns, and people that live in small towns will probably notice it, you get that little group of people at the upper-ups in the town council that 
front just everything. kind of run everything. Yeah. And some people are good being complacent, and some people are not so good being complacent. Yeah. Complacent, and and when you're an outsider in these towns, people tend to notice. I mean, yeah. I feel like I'm. I've only been in this town for like five years. It'll be five years at the end of this mm-hmm. month that I've been here, and. I'm just now starting to get to the point where I feel a little bit more comfortable in this town. You've but lived. I'm not making waves. I'm not making myself hugely known. I have lived here since 2009. <laughs> Early 2010. And, um, yeah. You, you kind of yeah. grew up here. So I think you sort of escape a little bit of the uh, the outsider territory. No one knows who I am. <laughs> That's fine. You can't so make waves if you're not known. Yeah, I don't want to fucking talk to anybody. I don't want to make waves. So because the town's that sm- this as small mm-hmm. as it is, and there's a whole bunch of people that were like descendants of original settlers and things like that. Right. A couple of the big names that come up in this are the Thompsons. Thompson family was one of like the OG families, been there for a super fucking long time, own a lot of property, have a lot of businesses. Everybody knows their name. Right. And the other name in this bunch is Dochev. I believe it's Dochev. I'm going to say Dochev. I can't remember how they Future pronounced Future Ari will correct us. <laughs> if we're wrong. Potentially. No promises. I don't think I'm wrong. But I might I be. trust you. <laughs> uh, Dochus is the other big name that comes mm-hmm. up in this. There's a few other names that do come up. I didn't really bother too much with writing names down just because I feel like... It's just the concept. What's happening... Exactly. What's happening in this town, in this situation is something that's very similar in a lot of small mm-hmm. towns. I feel like this story could have happened in a lot of different places. Right. So the reason why I brought up Dochev is uh, because of Cody Dochev. Now, according to Marv and according to Marv's tapes, which I'll play shortly after I say this, at the auction, Cody was apparently originally wanting that property. Cody had a concrete plant, like concrete company. Mm-hmm. And according to Marv, and whether or not this is true is completely unknown. The thing about small towns, it's really hard to get your hands on records, and records can be easily changed, which is one of the things that Marv does bring up in his tapes is that things were conveniently left out of the meeting minutes and stuff Mm -hmm. like that when he brought issues to light. So according to Marv, after the auction where Marv purchased the property for $42,000, Cody came up to him and berated him and just basically shit talked him and was like why the fuck did you do this like you don't fucking need this like i need this property according to marv he at that point turned around and was like well if you really want the property that bad like i'll sell it to you that's okay but with this small town thing i don't know if this conversation truly happened or if this is small town doing doing small town things but according to everyone else who are all part of this clicky little group in the small town, none of that ever happened. Come time for the auction, I, uh, Jeff Crane was down there with four older guys who were looking to invest some money in some FDIC properties, and I think there was about 160 properties for sale that day. And uh, anyway, this one finally came up for bid, and... uh, they well actually first they told me that there was a uh, EPA audit against the place, which was a they were recommending a twenty thousand dollar cleanup. They had all these surveys done by Chen Northern uh, was the EPA, was the company contracted to look at it. But anyway, uh, come to find out later later on that FDIC had done a lot of the cleanup that they had recommended, and I don't know for some reason I didn't realize that so. Uh, I, I told John about it, uh, or it came up for sale, came up on the on the block, and uh, they had a bid for $35,000 from some guy up in front. And uh, so we were going to pay sixty six. I was waving at them. They couldn't see me. So finally they caught my bid, so I got I had a bid for forty. and this other guy, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I, I didn't know who he was. He jumped up on his chair. That's how I knew where he was. And I was looking back, and of course he bid 45000 and of course, I bid fifty thousand, and was waiting for him to bid, and he wouldn't bid. Uh, and uh, so I got the property for fifty thousand dollars. And uh, this guy, 
Uh, come to find out his name was Cody Dochev. He came back there and introduced himself to me about, his, about the rudest, most arrogant person. I mean, this guy's just a fucking asshole. Come back and just introduced himself, kind of, by just giving me a tongue lashing for about 10 minutes about, you know, who I thought I was and what I was going to do with the property. And I explained to him I was buying it for John Kleiner. And uh, he said he wanted the property. And I said, well, I'll tell you, I'll sell you the property. I said, we were going to pay $66,000. And, uh, you know, I was I told him I was selling it to John Kleiner, who was going to start an automotive store there. And he didn't want to have anything to do with it. He said, bullshit. He says I only got... Gus Harris was his buddy there sitting beside him, I guess. And Gus was sponsoring the whole financing on this thing, and Gus wasn't going to pay more than 50 grand for it. And uh, I says, well, I'm sorry, but I says, you know, you, I can't just not come down here and spend my money and waste my time and not, you know, get make some money on it. So I offered it to him that day for what I was going to sell it to John for because I could tell the guy was pissed off, and I wasn't there to piss off any people. I mean, this is the only guy... Of all the properties that sold before his, that was doing any screaming at anybody during the auction. So, that's kind of a little bit up in the air. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of seen as, like, one of the things that sort of got Marv on the radar with the people in this town. The other thing that actually happened before this in 1991 is um, there was something brought forward about the possibility of legalizing gambling in Granby. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people were against it. The local newspapers were against it. Marb was all for it. He's like, hey, this could bring money to the town. This could help the town expand kind of thing. Right. Like, this could have great benefits. And everybody else was just like, well, they're they're just degenerates and they're just not good people, even professional gamblers. Right. That, like, that's all they do and they can somehow Which, make I mean, money yeah, off of it. It comes with the territory, but at the same time, like, you do make good money off of it because people will if, travel to <laughs> casinos and stuff like that when i first came up here in uh, 91 the gambling issue was getting started up here and i'm just sitting around my condo uh reading this newspaper and this guy is just blasting i mean he's just uh belittling him and slandering him as far as i was concerned just making the pro gamblers look like fools and i thought well what's wrong with these people they got no economy up here there, here's here's a, it, something that's happened down there in, in uh, Blackhawk and uh, over at Cripple Creek, and it's done good economic things for those communities. Why is he so against this? I never could understand that. So I finally, after he blasted some people that I knew here in town, I wrote him a letter and, uh, you know, told him, hey, this is America, you know, leave these people alone, you know. This, uh, this needs, this is, you don't have to be uh, making them look like some kind of fools, you know was the whole gist of my letter. Anyway, you know, he just didn't know who Marv Hemeyer was, but he definitely hated me because I, you know, said some things in the paper that were right on the button. So for a short two issues, Marv actually had his own newspaper that were talking up the benefits of <laughs> why they should allow the gambling. Ultimately, I don't think it went through, but that happened in 1991, and right. then this auction happened in 92. And that really kind of put Marv on the radar with the people in the town. I mean, they all kind of knew him already. He was known to do really, really good work, really solid welder. He was putting his custom bumpers. You're a bumpers. good worker, but, like, mm, he, yeah. we don't really like you. <laughs> like, through, through the course of the documentary. The documentary was originally a Netflix documentary called Tread that mm -hmm. I'm referencing here. Um, through the course of that, a lot of the people in the town were like, you know, he was a really great guy and... He was a really solid welder, and nobody could do better work than him. But these are also a lot of the people that he said kind of shit-dogged him. So I don't know if they're saying these things to kind of make themselves look better. Oh, they're they're saving or, face because they don't want to. They probably don't want to accept that they were part of the reasoning. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> so they're just fucking saving face. <laughs> I could not agree more. So I believe it was 1993 that everything kind of fell through with his friend that was talking about leasing the property from him. So he was like, well, I've got this property now, so I think I'm just going to open my own muffler shop up here. Mm -hmm. And at this point, he was still helping at the other shops that were down in the Denver Boulder area, I believe. Right. So he was kind of bouncing in between the two shops a little bit, but he got mm -hmm. this one established in the town of Granby after he had purchased the property. The timeline's a little bit weird on, 
on it for me personally, but at some point along the line, the town was like, hey, we want to annex this property and make it a part of the city. In the summer of 92, after I bought it, a um, guy named Bud Wilson, who is the superintendent of the uh, Water and Sanitation District down there in Granby, came to me and said that they wanted me to hook on to the, be annexed into the Water and Sanitation di District. So I said, great. I says, what, what do I have to do? I says, do I, is there, do I have to get an attorney involved or what? Do I? He said, no. He said, he'd do all the paperwork. And there was some kind of fee, I think, that I had to pay, but I don't remember anymore. But anyway, I was supposed to go to a meeting in September, I believe it was, and uh, get annexed into the Water and Sand. And uh, so we did. I went to the meeting, and uh, <laughs> I uh, just expected it to go through. And it was unbelievable what happened to that meeting. Um, the main topic of concern that they had with me being annexed into the district was that they didn't have a maintenance easement across the property that was just south of me. It was owned by Gus Harris. And uh, they had put in a water and sewer line years before, but it supposedly hadn't gotten this maintenance easement. And Gus Harris wanted to, wasn't going to give it to him or something. You know, I'm not really sure how that all worked, but this maintenance easement was a pretty big obstacle. And they basically told me, the board did, in the fall of 92, that I would never have water and sewer there until I got this maintenance easement from this Gus Harris guy. Well, I was a little upset because, you know, he was a super, Bud was a superintendent, and this was supposed to, I thought this was a done deal. So, you know, I left the meeting, and I didn't, didn't need to listen any more of their crap. They wasted a lot of my time. And, uh, you know, I, I knew that there was some animosity in the community. Uh... I had been getting uh, my hair cut down at this place called Lana's, and she had told me about how this Cody Dochev guy had tried to kill himself and had screwed a lot of people in the community and, uh, you know, had gone bankrupt, and uh, he was kind of, they, they were kind of glad that he wasn't there anymore, that he was out outside of town. He had moved up into uh, Dick Thompson's uh, gravel pit. And... I don't know if, if Marv didn't do his research and truly understand what the process mm -hmm. of annexing a property would be or would mean for him, but he was all for it, gung-ho, like, oh, yes, I'd, I'd love to be a part of the city. This would, That'd be totally awesome. I'd, mm -hmm. I'd love it. It'd be great. He had, he had big plans for the property, and the property wasn't that far off from a neighborhood. It was ultimately like a neighborhood and then Marv's property, and then a big open property next to it that comes into play later. Mm -hmm. But it was like right on the edge of town, not super far into town. So it was loosely considered the industrial area because that's where a lot of the businesses were. Yeah. Now, everything that comes up with Cody Dochev is a thing that ended up being a fight with Marv, essentially. Mm -hmm. So... Cody ended up buying that property that was just on the other side of Marv, just a little bit farther away from the neighborhoods, with the intention of making it into a concrete batch plant, ultimately a plant where they mix everything other together and then put everything in bags to make and sell concrete. That, right. that was his business. That's what he had been doing for a while. And one of the big things that got Marv on that was he, he didn't want it to be right next to his business like that. He didn't want to have to deal with all the dust. And the people in the nearby neighborhood, after after Marv finally started bringing attention to this, the people in the neighborhood nearby were like, hey, you know, he's right. Like, right, we, we, don't, don't want, we don't want this We don't here. want to have to deal with all this noise. We don't want to have to deal with all this dust. So they also started kind of putting in an uproar about it. And when these things were brought up at town meetings and... The people on the council were like, "Well, Cody, what are you gonna, what are you gonna do to fix these issues?" And he's like, "Oh, I can fix that. That, that won't be a problem. I can make sure that's taken care of." Everything that Marv was fighting for ended mm -hmm. up kind of falling through, and the town was like, "Well, 
He said he's going to follow all these rules, so congratulations, here's your concrete batch plant. I will let the tape speak for themselves on this little portion. One of the things that Marv did mention is that the zoning was done illegally on this property, that it was spot zoned. And spot zoning is uh, just basically taking one little section. If, if you've got a giant square that is all zoned as residential and mm-hmm. you take just one itty bitty little circle in the middle of that square and say, except for right here, this is industrial. This can have stuff built on it for industrial purposes. Uh, that's considered unlawful. They had gone to the town and rezoned Gus Harris's two, two acres, which is directly south of my muffler shop. They did this under protest, which is in the minutes, um, from the bro- er- owner of the Broken Arrow Motel, which was straight south of where the project was, was but where, where the rezoning was. And you know, I don't know if he didn't know it, or you know, if if they were counting on the public to be stupid, or uh, if they were counting on the fact that nobody had any money that they'd be able to protest this in court. But the town went and spot zoned the two acres directly south of me, which was illegal in Colorado. They had changed the HGB zoning on that two acres to industrial. And because no one protested it within 30 days, it became law that they could do that. The other problem that Marv was having with the property, aside from the zoning issues Mm -hmm. and dealing with the batch plant next door, was that as a part of being annexed into the city and becoming a part of the city with that property, it also required him to be hooked up to water and sewer lines, which was... 400 yards, I believe, away, mm-hmm. or 400 feet, 400 yards, I'm not sure, but it was really fucking Pretty close. Far. Ultimately, he would have been paying almost twice as much as he paid for the property just to get hooked up to the water and sewer mm-hmm. main, because that was the closest to his location. Why am I saying closest with air quotes? Because a lot of the people that determined whether or not these things were done properly were from that clicky little right. group. So... Marv was fighting him the whole way because he's like, I, why Why do I need to be hooked up to that? Like, I've got a well. I've got a septic tank. Like, I don't I don't get what the big deal is here. And they were like, well, you, you have to be hooked up. And they were ultimately giving him fines. And the fact that he was getting these fines and he felt like he was being belittled by the town council and just everything kind of piled up. Right. And ultimately, after dealing with all of this, and I I do really encourage people to watch the Tread documentary. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's it's free with ads on YouTube. Um, And by all means, look up the Marv Heenmeyer audio tapes because it's it's his perspective of the story. It's a little rambly at bits, but pieces of that are included in the Tread documentary. Mm -hmm. And after watching the documentary and then turning around and listening to the tapes in their entirety, it really kind of helps pull the story together, I You can see the... I hate to say it, but you can see the reasoning. Yes. And you can see how you get... How someone can be pushed to this point when... Yes, he was, absolutely. He was just trying to be a part of the community. Like, he just wanted to, you know, enjoy his mountains and a little piece of heaven. And it's just like... You, you get these people that are stuck in that high school mentality <laughs> and they never leave their little high school cliques and then they get power and it just kind of ruins it for anyone. Like there, were, it's always the people are like, we need to grow this town. We need to get like tourism in here. We need, you know, to make our, our economy better and all of this kind of stuff. And then they like push out anyone that's like trying to come in and be like oh you guys are making this area seem like really really nice i want to i want to start a business here and then like they come here mm-hmm. and they start a business and like the people that were like yeah we need to grow this now oh we don't want your business though right. it's not that small town kind of thing you're gonna ruin our small town it's like you're complaining that your town is small and you need more people because like yeah, it, 
towns die when all of the young people leave because there's not those jobs because they're taken by all the older people that Mm -hmm. aren't gonna leave those jobs until they keel over so they're like "Mm, we gotta move because all the housing's taken up all, all this like so they have to leave and if you don't get those new people coming in and like the reasons to build you know housing divisions and all this other kind of stuff it just fucking kills a town exactly sadly that's what's happening to our current town yes but but the people in our town are actually trying so it's just i see how he was pushed to the edge yes how and i feel like if you're from a big town and you're in a big city listen to the tapes to kind of understand it because otherwise you're not gonna yeah, he, yeah, he really does kind of explain, feel, like, jumping forward some time. And right. the muffler business was pretty damn successful. Mm-hmm. Um, but the city was getting pissed at him. They're like, you're not hooked up to water and sewers, so we're going to fine you X amount of dollars every day. And he wrote a check, but he wrote the words down wrong, and I guess he didn't realize it. And maybe he overreacted a little bit, but they basically returned his check and said the amount was wrong. Right. And it was for no reason other than because when he wrote down, like, 3,000 however many hundred he he wrote the wording wrong and they were like you gotta fix that and then it's fine he fixed that and it was fine but not until after he got like super pissy so I mean I would be pissed (laughs) there's this ever-growing list of people that have upset him and a, a fair amount of them are people that were on the town board so a lot of the places that he attacked and the buildings that he destroyed Mm -hmm. were all tied into these people that had done him wrong I realize that a lot of this information is not very thorough, but the reason why I'm not going so thorough on this is because there really truly is good information out there that is easily, easily findable Mm -hmm. and readily available. However, this, this entire thing is a bit more of our perspective, obviously it's our podcast. So getting into 2001, at this point, Marv had put a lawsuit against the city and against Cody Docheff for how everything went with getting the concrete batch plant up mm-hmm. and running and because some shady stuff was going on. He was still getting fined all the time from the city and Cody approached him and was like, look, man, when we put in the batch plant, we connected to the city lines. We'll give you an easement if you want to connect to the city lines through us. But all you got to do is drop the lawsuits. Drop the lawsuit against us and drop the lawsuit against the city and we'll give you the easement. You won't have to pay us or anything like that. Like, totally fine. Which we'll is get, shady. <laughs> we'll get it handled. So, it was in a, in a little bit blackmail. Like, we're a gonna, little bit it, of an ultimatum. It kind of it kinda <laughs> came across as like, a, we're going to make your life a living hell unless you stop doing this to us. Because it it's annoying. Yeah. So, Marv was like, no. Nah. You're, you're not going to bully me into this bullshit. Like, I've got a well. I've got a septic system. The septic system was actually a concrete mixer that was just kind of buried in the ground. Uh, which was a See, big... It, and this was a... The whole septic system issue is a big reason why he didn't end up... Everything fell through with selling that property to the friend. Because he was like, yeah, well, you got the property, but... I'm going to have to sink a lot of money into this before I can even do what I want to do with it. Like, it's right. in your name right now. I would have to fix this... Like, right off the bat, before I can even open my business. Mm -hmm. Marv was a little bit grandfathered in because I believe he had the business open before it was annexed into the city, but I'm not positive on that detail. Right. But, I mean, I do understand because, I mean, the whole thing that makes you a part of the city is the whole, like, you're hooked up to the city, Mm -hmm. power, water, and, you know, sewer lines. So, I get why the city has to have that. But at the same time, they should have worked with him about it versus, like, figure this shit out. <laughs> because usually when they're, like, they are the ones that are approaching to be, like, hey, we want to bring this into the city. And most of the time, they'll, like, hey, I know sometimes they'll either be, like, hey, let's split the cost or we're going to do this. Uh, we'll pay you to do it. They, like, cities are usually going about this a lot better. <laughs> than what they did to him. And I think it was really much, they were just like, you know what? This guy fucked with one of our own. We're going to fuck with him. Right. (laughs) Because I know damn well if that one dude actually bought it and they were like, hey, we're going to annex you in. Like, just, hey, 
plan for been... this time to this time we're going to be there putting this shit in no cost to you yeah well i mean even if it wasn't a cost to him he had investors mm-hmm. and he had he had that huge business going right. in the area already so ultimately marv's lawsuit against cody in the city fell through in 2002 after that lawsuit was dismissed, he turned around and blamed the failure on his lawyer. He said his lawyer didn't fight hard enough, and his lawyer had told him, and this is in the tapes, that his lawyer had told him that he would not appeal it, no matter how much Marv wanted him to. Marv really fe- felt that it should have been appealed to a higher court, because he, in his own words, felt like they had caught the city with its pants down with how they did this zoning, and how right. it was kind of shady, how this concrete batch plant was just kind of allowed to be there, mm-hmm. like... They were pouring the foundation and planning everything out and basically building the buildings before the zoning was approved and everything. Yep. So, and that's, (laughs) and that's what a lot of his fight was over. So because that was dismissed in 2002, Marv kind of knew, all right, well, this is going to be the zoning now. Like I, I, there, I can't change that. Like he'd already dumped almost 150 grand into this, like right. fighting this entire thing over the course of about 10 years up until this point. So in 2002, he ended up going out to California to a large equipment auction. And at this point, that's where he found his Komatsu bulldozer. And She's sitting up. <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta adjust. I'm sliding off the chair. She's getting prepared. <laughs> so he finds this Komatsu bulldozer and he gets it shipped to Granby in July of 2002. And they, according to the Thompson brothers, I believe it was. No, it wasn't according to the Thompson brothers. So at some point, um, he ended up subletting that the boat storage property, right. the building that he used. He ended up subletting that to the trash company. They were becoming a larger company and they needed somewhere to be able to keep their trucks. And Marv was like, yeah, you know, you can, that's, that's absolutely no problem. You can kind of use that. And he had gone out and he had gotten this Komatsu bulldozer in the middle of the night. They're unloading it off of the trailer because it got shipped from California. So it was probably a long fucking drive. I, yeah. I bet anything that was just when he got there. And what he did was he parked it up, up by like the access road to the property and put a sign on it that said for sale. Which is a huge fucking bulldozer so he goes out to california buys a bulldozer brings back puts a for sale sign on it he's like okay so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna hold an auction of my own right i've got the stuff that's on the property i've got the property itself i'm gonna see what i can sell i believe he said i that he had five things on the property Mm -hmm. and the only things that did not sell were the property and the bulldozer and this was prior to the trash company buying it right as that company got bigger, they ended up offering Marv $400,000 for the entirety of the property. Now, prior to this, so Marv had bought it for $42,000 at auction. At one point, offered to sell it to Cody, but that didn't happen. And then turned around and put a price tag on it to Cody of $250,000, and Cody was like, yeah, and Marv was like, no, never mind. <laughs> okay. And this is according to the documentary. So this is where a, it's a little wishy-washy about the offers. So gotcha. an offer of $250,000 was made. One party says that Cody said no, and one party says that Marv said no. And then the offer was changed to $350,000. Mm-hmm. One party says that Cody said no. One yeah. party says that Marv said no. So it's a little bit wishy-washy. Ultimately... I wouldn't be surprised if Marv said no because I just don't think he wanted Cody to have the I think it was property. out of spite at that point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so coming up towards the auction, he had put a price tag on the town on the town. Wow. On the property <laughs> of four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Because as he was building and improving the property, he was getting things reappraised, which right. makes sense. So the co- the value of the property had actually increased significantly. At this point he was looking to increase his profits on it tenfold just on the purchase price not including the cost of all the the lawsuits and things that he lost money on so i mean all things considered he he probably made out with like maybe two hundred thousand dollars in profit right maybe so he ended up selling it ultimately for four hundred thousand dollars to the trash company because he liked the guy i believe his name was travis Mm mm-hmm 
because he liked the guy. It was a friendly guy, and he was like, "Good on you. You're doing good business." I yeah. I just want to keep renting out this little this little building. So he he back rented or back leased or something like that. Ultimately, I I think the fifty thousand dollar difference in what Marv wanted versus what they paid was kind of like okay, well. $50,000 off, just let me stay in this building. And they're like, yeah, cool, whatever. No big difference to us. Right. So, I'm going to pose a question here. Do you believe in fate and that the entire span of what you're going to do in your life is laid out for you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> or I feel like there are multiple paths to different fates. I think I think it's like, a, hey, you make this choice, you end up here. Right. You make this choice, you end up there. So, I feel like... You still hold that power, but, like, once you do something, it's going to set this thing in motion kind of thing. Right. Well, Marv believed in fate, and Marv believed in God. God was, he, was, he was a God-fearing Christian. Mm. Really strong belief Christian, man. He, he hated Catholics. He says it in the tape. He's like, <laughs> Catholics are, like, useless. As far as he's concerned, and a lot of the town was Catholic, so that's probably <laughs> so that's probably another oh, reason. I wonder why he was swayed to that opinion. <laughs> but from everything that Marv said, he was sitting in his hot tub, as at, one at, does, <laughs> at, at his Grand Lake property, <laughs> looking out over the land, and he just he felt this calmness come about him, and he just knew what he had to do. So he decided that he it's a was very scary thing when a man figures out what he needs to do. Well, what's crazy is in the grand scheme of his life, he was he was in his fifties, fifty one, fifty two, or was mm-hmm. how old he was. Around was he the time married? This he never married. Okay. He never had kids. He did date, but nothing was ever that long a term. And he felt like God had put him on this earth and gave him all the successes that he had when he was young, so that he would be ready to do this mission that he felt that his God crusade. Had given. It is crusade you're right I want to say right now if I would have been married had a family you know things may have gone different but God built me for this job he rewarded me for 45 50 years with the lifestyle that I am so thankful for and, and and it's unfortunate the poor people in Granby, so many of them were so jealous of my lifestyle that I could come and go as I pleased. Well, God blessed me in advance for the task that I am about to undertake. And you know, I, I, I've tossed this. I mean, I have fought this for years now. Here it is, 2004, uh, April of 2004. It was some time in 2001, I believe, and I mean, I'm, I'm six, 2000 or 2001, that the peace, I, I mean, I wept at times trying to understand why this was happening to me. And to do what I had to do to make these people listen, to learn, was just above me. And when I realized that one day when I was sitting in the hot tub and I mean I was I was weeping a peace came over me that has only come over me a few times before in my life where I knew that what I was doing was tough but it was the right thing and that it was above me it wasn't me I was doing this because God wanted me to do it and I didn't understand it. I said, why did you ask me to do this? Is that why I've never been married? So I didn't have a family? Is that why I've always been successful? So that I would realize my reward before doing this task? I don't know. There are other things I can ask. Had I not carried my cross earlier, and now God had prepared me, to carry this cross? I believe so. And I'm carrying the cross willingly now. At first, I fought it. But it has to be done. And the world will write stories about how wrong I am and everything. And without a doubt, I wish it could be done a different way. 
But there is no way to make this right. October of 2003. The trash company now owns the property for the mm-hmm. cost of $400,000. And Marv has his little sublease on mm-hmm. that little workshop that he still had. And he figured something out. He figured out that conveniently enough, the Komatsu, I believe it was a D33. That sounds about right. Uh, no, uh, the Komatsu D355A yeah. bulldozer that he had purchased. Conveniently conveni- fit? <laughs> conveniently enough, had two inches of clearance in height and one inch of clearance in width to get into the building. Ooh, through the garage squeeze. door. Yeah. Tight squeeze. She so was like, well, you know, it's crazy. I was looking at buying a totally different bulldozer, but I bought this one and this one fits. It must be a part of God's plan for me. It's part of the fucking crusade. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is meant to happen. So this is what's going to happen. And through the entire time of him building this bulldozer, he was like, you know, I was expecting literally anything to stop me. I was expecting someone to catch me doing what I was doing. See, some dude to walk in the workshop and be like, what what you do? What you... Oh. What's absolutely insane. What the fuck are you doing in here? (laughs) What's absolutely insane is after the purchase by the trash company of the property... Yeah. First of all, within 24 hours, they were hooked up to water and sewer. Cody was just like, yeah, I'll let you guys hook up. No problem. (laughs) Oh, my God. They were fucking with this man so bad. They're I really just like, think they oh, were. you own this property? I guess that's okay. Like, I really think they were. <laughs> and oh, my God. Dude, so you know how they no, needed to that be would able to fuel my purpose so much fucking more. I think it walking did. in and seeing that like they're hooking like this fucking place up and like the trash can. I like, think it. Hey, did. buddy, like, we, but the we gotta thing hook is, this up. Is and the bulldozer <laughs> was in the. I'm pretty sure the bulldozer was in the building before the purchase happened. <laughs> them coming so, in and be like hey after we're gonna these water lines up actually i'm like 90 i'm like 90 like percent <laughs> sure that the, the bulldozer was in the building before the purchase happened okay so after the trash company purchased it they needed to be able to insure the buildings on the property and in order to insure a building you need to have a thorough inspection inside and out of the building for structural damage so we so, can't fit in this building. <laughs> Why not? Well, you see, this man has so, this dozer. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> Marv had everything covered up with tarps and things like that. So we don't know what this giant tarp is. But um, they all knew about. It they all so. knew that the bulldozer existed. They all knew that he managed to squeeze the bulldozer into the building. Oh. They didn't question anything. Oh. So these guys come in. Oh, wow, what's this? Uh, this is the dozer. Oh, okay. Uh, well, what's this lift, they say. And I say, well, I made up this story about this guy from Minnesota who uh, was a professor at the university there and was working on a system to, uh, um, it was called, uh, God, I can't even think of it right now, when you deep freeze things. Uh, Cyro- chirogenics or something like that. I said this this professor was perfecting a chirogenics cooling system to go in the intake of the diesel engine, which would cool the air uh, and increase the uh, performance of the engine and increase the um, the uh, hourly fuel consumption. And and they bought it. They said, I says, but the lift goes when I leave. You know, when, when this guy comes to pick his dozer up after he's done all this testing, you know, we had to, we had to we put this lift in so we could lift this big 800-pound condenser up on the back, you know, which he uh, had mismeasured, and we, they had to take it back to Minnesota. And then he's got this other uh, evaporator that we had to lift, plus the big the pump has got to go on there. We're running that off of a drive an auxiliary drive, PTO drive that they've got on the engine. I, I had this all bullshit story, and they went along with it. You know? I said, I, I couldn't believe it when they walked out the door. <laughs> Future Ari, include that laugh. <laughs> Just... <laughs> 
yeah, this man, Professor Wigglebottom, is coming over. <laughs> Why did he's... you have to go with Wigglebottoms? <laughs> he's coming to help with my cooling lines. I don't know why this is why it matters to you, but he's going to make it more powerful. And oh, do you yeah. think, oh my God, could you imagine being this insurance inspector and like be, having being told that someone is coming to help make this thing more powerful? And then like down the road when, you know, the event happened, just being like, there are so many people oh, that were like, I oh no. could have potentially oh no. stopped this. Oh no. Yeah. I fucked up. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. <laughs> and oh, he, he, he built this bulldozer over the course of roughly a year and a half. Mm-hmm. And he had like a section of that little warehouse that he was working in with the bulldozer kind of walled off. So he had a little living area and he had a cot and a hot plate and some water and stuff in there. And he basically lived there. A lot of the time, Mm -hmm. the people at the trash company figured that he'd like wait until they left for the day and then he'd start working so he could make all kinds of noise and it wouldn't matter. And he actually put a lift system in there that would lift up these huge half inch steel plates that he was using to armor up the vehicle. And what he was doing was he was using the lift to kind of like pick it up and hold it while he'd weld it in place. I don't know where he bought these supplies from. You'd be surprised. <laughs> Just like, well, he also had the he he still had access to the other muffler shops, so he could have gotten things through there too, and oh, people yeah. wouldn't have really noticed that ne- necessarily. Ordered it through a catalog. So he's, or he's something. lifting up these huge sheets of metal, welding them on the sides, and what he did was he put spacers. So he did two half-inch sheets of metal, of steel, mm-hmm. with spacers in between, and he was pouring concrete in between. <laughs> Getting the fucking concrete from the dude down the road. <laughs> I mean, maybe. <laughs> he did say that he had bought, an, uh, he was trying to be supportive of Cody at one point, and he had bought an, some concrete from Cody, but he also said that the mix was shit, yeah. in his own words. Oh, so he probably didn't use it then. Hard to say. Purposely went to the competition. Ultimately, the entire time that he was doing this, he also had, like, security cameras and stuff on the building, so oh, he'd so be he went full like, paranoid over he it? Went, he went full paranoid. Now, the thing about this tank because at this point we're gonna call it a tank. it's a tank and this is okay i know you're gonna think you believe me but it's like this reason of how armored and how much he made this thing look like a fucking tank of why mm-hmm. they called it killdozer so like if you see i think they have media footage of him driving it around yes there there like, is lots of footage available there's actually footage that was recorded directly from the police officers right. that were there I as well do not blame the media at all for naming it Killdozer? And that's just it. Is It's the media that dubbed it Killdozer. Yes. Marv himself called it the MK Tank or Marv's Komatsu Tank in the audio recording. Honestly, calling it Marv's Tank is honestly probably what a lot of I people think that actually know the story probably, yeah. uh, refer to it to. I know. That, <laughs> do you know that the date that it happened is referred to as Killdozer Day? I did not, but I do now. People celebrate it. So, ultimately, this... Uh, modified Komatsu D35. This tank. <laughs> this Komatsu D355A was fitted with armor plating that covered the cabin, the engine, and parts of the tracks. It survived three external explosions and over 200 rounds of ammunition that were fired at it. So, for visibility, to be able to control the tank, he had fitted, I believe, five video cameras linked to two monitors that he had inside. Could you imagine and he if had he had covered, today's technology right. to do this? Oh my god, and, this man would be unstoppable. And he had covered those cameras mm-hmm. with Lexan glass, mm-hmm. so they were essentially bullet resistant. Now, he had also thought about, well, I'm going to be bulldozing things gonna have to deal with debris and stuff and this is a fun little fact that drew told to me be- yeah. <laughs> like 30 seconds before they said it in the documentary he'd actually put compressed air nozzles in strategic places and around on the outside to be able to blow the dust and debris off of the cameras so he wouldn't lose his vi- visibility so he'd be able to kind of just go tss and just right and like no off. one thought that he thought of this so like they had no idea how to mm-hmm. go about this fucking thing and also, <laughs> this entire thing was happening in June. Hot as fuck. Yeah. So he was like, well, it's going to get sweaty. So he put fans and an RV air conditioner in there just to make sure he didn't get too hot well, while yeah, driving. Well, yeah, because honestly, he would have been in, in there. Box. Yeah. If he was in there for like 20 minutes to 
30 minutes like he would have been like he had absolutely no idea how long this was potentially gonna last he prepared for as long as possible Mm -hmm. just in case they actually found enough food and water in there to last for a week but he said in his recordings that he made prior to everything that happened that everything could break down right as he's driving it out yeah he he could have just left the garage and just be like oh he said i could have a heart attack and die and that would be the end of it Mm -hmm. but if nothing stops me then this is meant to happen right he entirely felt that this was god's plan for him and that god made him for this purpose to show the Mm -hmm. people of granby that that is not how you treat people and the funny thing is is everything that i saw in the documentary the people in granby have not changed no and he wanted to tell them like like that he was basically the devil that they forgot Mm -hmm. essentially just rip some lyrics from a song but like oh god it, it, it really does describe it to where they think they're all high and mighty and he's like hey you guys like pushed me to this i think we've beat around the bush of what he did <laughs> a lot we did but that's okay because we're gonna go to that next well they really did push him to this point and they honestly i feel bad for him mm-hmm. that they didn't learn the lesson and that's a hot take but they didn't but, learn. <laughs> well, I feel like it's kind of... The people of Granby did not learn their lesson. Everyone else around Everyone them. Everyone else did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, on June 4th, 2004, starting around 2.15 p.m., roughly, he started up the bulldozer. He, he drove out of the garage and everything began started heading towards the mountain park concrete company which was the co- the company that cody owned and mm-hmm. heading towards all of that now the the trash company had like a, a dispatch lady i guess oh no <laughs> <laughs> she's just like sitting working and just sees this fucking dozer like leave and go huh yeah that is fucking interesting. I believe interesting. her name was Sherry, and I'm pretty oh sure the God. documentary actually starts with her 911 call. She made two 911 calls. Um, the first one she made was like, hey, so there's a bulldozer, and it's kind of destroying the concrete plant. And the dispatcher's like, oh. What? And she's like, is there anybody in it? And she's like, well, yeah, I think so, but it's all covered in metal. You can't see inside. Well, well there has to be fucking somebody in it. Like, uh, it made a 90-degree turn. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, and then for, for whatever reason, that call ends, and then she ends up calling back a little bit later, and she's like, hey, so it's me from the trash it's company again. again. <laughs> um, He's driving through the batch plant now, and the dispatcher's like, oh, batch plant? Okay, like, she's taking notes. She's trying to, like, dispatch officers. She's trying to figure out what the fuck is going on, and this lady on the phone is just sitting there in horror. <laughs> hey i don't mean to interrupt your day or i feel like she's like this sweet little old lady too it's just like hey <coughs> oh sherry yeah she sounded younger she sounded like yeah. maybe in her 20s based on her voice oh oh so she's like anxiety ridden mm. hey um this dude's kind of driving through the building what do you mean he's driving through the building he's kind of going through the building can so, you see who's inside mm. No. <laughs> well, at, at the time of all of this, Cody was actually on the property. He was over by the gravel pit. Do you imagine turning around? Hmm, I'm hearing a noise, and you see your building just get fucking. It wasn't into. even so much hearing a noise. He got a call over the radio from his own dispatch lady. Hey, hey Cody, I think that you was might like need Cody. Cody, you need to get the fuck up here. Something's going on, and and he gets up there and he sees this bulldozer that's just. Dozing up all of his stuff. <laughs> it's dozing. Yeah. It's doing its intended purpose. <laughs> no, there were a few employees that were trying to stop the bulldozer by like shoving things in the tracks and things, which shoving things in the track would typically make sense. But, but. at this point, that bulldozer was heavy. And I'm honestly not completely sure how it had enough power to move itself at that point with all the extra I weight that he had. I believe he replaced the engine. Ah, okay, okay. I do believe. That would be a question to ask Teddy. But Ted Burt is in a cranky mood. We're yep. not doing that today. But uh, I do believe that he replaced the engine and he did things because he did think of like, hey, I'm adding all of this extra weight. He I planned need, so I need much to ahead on this. move it. So I do believe he added things to make it more powerful. Yes. So... They were trying to cram stuff into the treads, 
to or into the tracks to try and totally stop it. Totally throwing fucking shovels and shit, and like uh, that's just... they'd actually grabbed a whole bunch of like half inch angle iron and stuff like that, thinking that <laughs> that would make a difference. They were trying to wedge that in there, but it was just cutting through that shit like butter. Yeah, did not care, and it was all because of the weight. If you don't know a whole lot about tanks. While shoving things into the track is typically a good idea if you are trying to take the track off and disable it. Right, that's all really of all the you're weight able to do. on a tank. It's not like a car tire where it's constantly rotating. Whatever part is touching the ground has a whole fuck ton of weight on it. Mm-hmm. Like you stick your hand under that bitch, it's gone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So really, that's like the main way to disable the tank from moving is, is, the, is to get the, the track tracks. Off. Yeah. yeah, but it wasn't really working. And one of the employees just happened to have a pistol, and he hands it to Cody, and he's like, "Here, it's loaded." And Cody's like, "Fucking it, better be." And he takes a couple of shots. Why? I don't know. Do they not lucky, care about ricochet? I was gonna say, lucky nobody got hit with. Oh ricochet. my god, no! If anyone was gonna fucking die, it would be from these fuckers being real dumb, being like, "Let's stand twenty feet away from it and shoot into the right. fucking metal," that as if physics doesn't exist, as the man is dis- <laughs> demolishing everything. The great fucking example of how physics work. Exactly. <laughs> like so. Obviously, he wasn't able to. Sorry, I'm assuming he was either in that middle or a 45. That shit wasn't doing anything. It was depicted as a revolver. It could have still been a 45. Like, 45 I, maybe. I, would, I would think maybe a 45. Ultimately, when, when the gun didn't work and trying to shove stuff in the tracks didn't work, Cody was like, well. I'm going to go grab my front end loader and I'm just going to try and pick the son of a bitch up because if I pick it up on one side or if I pick it up on the you back... machinery to fight machinery. That's exactly what a lot of this was. There, and he was like, okay, so I'm going to do this. I think that it is so very fucking at this symbolic point, that the dude that started it all it's, is it's, trying to defeat the man in the dozer with yet another thing of heavy equipment. It just makes me think of like Godzilla fighting King Kong. Yeah. <laughs> This dude, like, no, my God, like, it, it, the dude, but the, honestly, the huge was automatically, is, like, oh, oh he yeah. He was like, using a front-end loader on tires, on air tires, so he's got that air to worry about, and he doesn't have that stability and that, that contact with the ground. Mm-hmm. So. It's still so funny, the, the fucking at this, mindset of this. <laughs> at this point. There's a state trooper and a sheriff that are both there. The state trooper and the sheriff are just trying to figure out what the fuck's going on and, like, establish things and right. wait for backup because they're like, oh, we need the National Guard. I don't know what the fuck to do. <laughs> we need our own tank. God damn it. <laughs> they, were, they were requesting the National Guard and SWAT teams and helicopters and, like, anything. Like, Honestly, get they were at, smart. Send everyone. <laughs> they were smart to be like, we need we need the, the, the army because, like... <laughs> We need our own tank to fight this tank. And in this entire process, when they were trying to... This is a little bit early on information, but it's not going to hurt anything to throw it out there. Through this entire process, and in the documentary, it's mentioned that they had help coming. They had armored vehicles coming, but they were, like, two hours away. (laughs) So, could you you imagine if he did get shot with the tank, and he's just like, huh? pretty good at wielding (laughs) so cody's like well i gotta stop this thing i'm gonna go grab my front end loader so the sheriff is standing there and the state trooper is standing there and all the employees are standing there and they're watching all this happen and all of a sudden just come flying around the corner with this front end loader cody's like i fucking got this i'm just gonna pick up this bit and i'm gonna lift it up and it's not gonna be a problem and he rams into the side of it full force throws his face against the windshield knocks himself out for a second (laughs) So completely no. Which no, at this no. point, if you see a fucking dozer that has all of this nice welding and metal on it, and like nothing is working to get this thing, why do you fucking think that this thing's gonna be light he enough was for trying me to, to ram save into his, it? He was trying to save his business. He was well, trying yeah, to be a hero. Ultimately, <laughs> yeah. But so, you could tell this himself dude was like a, a jock. <laughs> he knocks himself out for a second by ramming against this fucking thing. <laughs> And at this point, they had already shot at it multiple times. You know both, the two cops. Both with handguns, both with handguns, and I believe the I believe the sheriff had a shotgun, and he right. was like using that a little bit, just trying to do anything. You know these two cops want to just do fucking knock himself out, and they're like, 
Apparently fucking... he was only out for about that long, but that impact was just enough for Marv to be like, hey, what the fuck was that? Now, the other thing that this tank was set up with is he had gun ports. Ooh. Oh, yeah. He had, he had a 50 cal, a 22, and one other one that I can't remember. I believe it was a 308. It was a 308. I love the... F- oh, my God. Those are all vastly fucking different calibers. For vastly different purposes. At no point in this situation. So the only reason why I am so against this being referred to as killdozer is when all of the information is prevent- presented, including the Hemeyer tapes, at no point did Marv intend to kill anyone. No. No matter how pissed off at these people, he did not want to kill anyone. He just wanted to destroy what they had because they destroyed what he had. Mm-hmm. So, Cody smashes against the side of this bulldozer, and he knocks himself out for a second. Marv's like, hey, what the fuck is that? And he looks out the side, and he's like, hmm. So he starts taking pot shots at the bucket of the front end loader. No, he He's not shooting at Cody. No. He could very easily have just tilted it a little bit more and just pop out, and <laughs> it would have been over with. He was shooting at the front end loader just to kind of be like, fuck off. You don't fuck with me. Like, you're not stopping this. Like, I think that's what he and really was trying to do. And it wasn't until that point that Cody, he, he kind of woke up and he realized where he was and and the shots and everything. He's like, well, that didn't work. I'm just going to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> well, I don't think I'm going to be the hero today. <laughs> not so much. So, this thing topped out at a blistering five miles an hour. Yeah, that's why it took a 15 minutes to go, like, 200 feet. <laughs> and as he was leaving the concrete plant after he destroyed everything that he wanted to destroy, mm-hmm. because he had a list. He had certain yeah. people that he wanted to affect, certain buildings that he wanted to hit, people that had pissed him off. Mm-hmm. So as he's leaving the concrete plant, the officers were like, hey, so we should send out a reverse 911 call, tell everybody to shelter in place. <sighs> Wait for it. And then they realized, wait a minute. This dude's hitting buildings. <laughs> this dude's hitting buildings. <laughs> Everybody get the fuck out of town. <laughs> and one of, the, one of the sheriff's deputies, uh, he was referred to as an undersheriff. I think it's like second, in, kind of second in command yeah. kind of thing. Um, Glenn Trainer, Ironic. Huh. Uh, he climbed on top of the bulldozer. Ooh. Now, I forgot to mention this. Before Cody grabbed the front end loader, he was trying to climb up on the back of it. And this was before too much rubble had been piled on top of the mm-hmm. bulldozer. He tried to climb up on the back, but he kept sliding down. <laughs> because Marv lubricated the fucking thing. <laughs> he fucking thought about it. But I'm guessing enough, like, debris enough, yeah. and stuff ended up on top of there that at some point... It's coated with, like, a thin layer of cement at this point, if we're honest. At some point, uh, Glenn Trainer was able to climb on top of it and this quote i'm gonna leave this quote this quote i don't know who said it i'm pretty sure it would have been glenn trainer he wrote it like a bronc buster trying to figure out a way to get a bullet inside the dragon yeah but we we know that more fucking like thought about someone getting on top that's why he like you know lubricated it but if he's going through buildings he's got to know that wasn't gonna last right so he dropped a flash brain grenade down the exhaust. That didn't really work. He, he was looking for, like, a handle to try and get into it and mm-hmm. couldn't find anything. I'd imagine it was kind of like a submarine where it's, like, the rotating handle that's only on the inside. Yeah, because I was going to say, like, I thought there was, like, some places that it was, like, oh, he, like, welded himself in or, like... He, he did not, ultimately, did I don't believe, weld to, himself like... in. I think he had a hatch on the top, but it only had a handle on mm-hmm. the inside. So once he was in, he was in. Yeah. Um, and while he was up there, he was able to see that there was the, it was basically like an RV mm-hmm. air conditioner on the top and he took his pistol out and tried to like see if he could shoot any way through there and it didn't make a difference. And so he's just like, well, he's, and, and he's driving down the road at five miles an hour. Yeah. Like there's officers like escorting this thing around town cause they can't stop it, but they yeah. want people to get out of the way. So they're like, well, lights and sirens, I guess. It's a parade. And this, and this, oh, guy's, like riding, this, parade. And this guy's riding on the top of this fucking tank thing. And he's approaching other targets that he wants to hit. And he's like, well, I might as well just get off because he's going to hit another fucking building. And I don't want to yeah. be on here when that happens. So he's heading towards the Granby Town Hall at this point because it was the town board that had post- 
pissed him off a lot. Yeah. And in the basement of the town hall was actually the public library. Mm -hmm. So they were hosting story hour for kids downstairs when everything began. They did manage to get the reverse 911 call that was like, get the fuck out. So all the adults were able to get all of the kids out. Nobody was in the town hall at the time that this happened. Um, One of the witnesses in that situation actually mentioned that, like, they had just gotten home, just turned on the radio to hear that town hall was just destroyed. Like, right as they got home. So they, like, just barely made it out. Mm -hmm. After that, he turned towards the Liberty Savings Bank. And aimed at a corner office in particular because that lady worked on the zoning board. Mm. Like it was just, it was picking and choosing these people. And after Liberty Savings Bank, just for that corner office, mm. he was picking and choosing very particular places on certain buildings too. So after the Liberty Savings Bank, he turned towards the local newspaper, um, right. Sky High News, because that guy pissed him off and because... He felt like that guy wronged him because he never did a news article that he said he was going to do on Marv's business. And that guy, he basically said he tried to go there multiple times, but Marv was never there, which I can kind of see. Right. But, I mean, leave a voicemail, leave a note. Right. I mean, also at he this, ended up this He ended up Marv saying he like... gave Marv a $200 ad space, which, fucking forgive me. 2004. Yeah. He takes a picture of Marv. Puts up some ad space saying, hey, if you need your muffler done, go to Marv. Woo. Yeah. And he says it's a $200 ad space. But it was like maybe like two inches by three inches on the page. Like mm, if that, small. like it was kind of small. $200 ad space. Hmm. Like that seems a little money hungry to me. Right. Anyway. So he, he hits the newspaper, which was crazy because they were running out the back door. As he was heading As he was coming in the front. And the the one guy did say, I, I feel bad for forgetting his name. Uh, the one guy did say that it, he said the roof was coming down around them like as they were running out. But I don't think it was that action movie, if that makes sense. Like, uh, I don't think it was like, oh, I'm running. Shit I don't think down. it was like, it oh, I'm like... running down the hallway and everything's collapsing around me no. and I'm taking a flying leap out this open door at the end. Like... Unless that building was like hella fucking like past like code. <laughs> then... I don't know. <laughs> and after the newspaper, he turned around and went for the Thompson family home. And the Thompson family home, it was just a small house. The only person that was there was the Thompson mom, little sweet old lady. And one of the boys called and was like, you've got to get in the car. Just get the fuck out of town. She's like, what? No, you're joking. You're joking. And he's like, no, I'm not joking. Get the, get fuck, the fuck out. out. <laughs> and he completely leveled that house. Probably Aww. leveled a lot of memories. And he, in that situation, he only hurt one little old lady. Like, not actually hurt, but like emotionally scarred. Yeah. She did get out fine and everything. But that's Nobody, all as I said before, nobody died as a result of this except for Marv. Yeah. Which, I mean, in a situation like this, you kind of have to expect that. Yeah. So after the Thompson family home, as he's moving from place to place, the the cops are trying to figure out a way to stop it. They're trying to figure out what they can use to stop Mm -hmm. it. They got a hold of the the road commission. Yeah. And they were like, hey, we need, like, some plows, some heavy anything. Like, get us some shit. See if you can, like, push against it or, like, park in its way or anything. So they brought out a scraper to try and stop it and he just kind of went mm, yeah and like shoved it out yeah. of the way like and that that is in the documentary from helicopter footage mm-hmm. and these things are massive like right. you can't really tell in this helicopter footage but like these things are fucking huge like the scraper mm-hmm. that they're using is easily twice as long as the bulldozer that he's got but his is upgraded and he yeah. just kind of shoves it his out of the is way heavier <laughs> exactly after pushing that scraper aside he made his way towards the propane storage yard at which point officers put out like a announcement to mm-hmm. all the other officers that everybody had to stay at least a thousand feet away yeah because if he hits the shit it's gonna blow because his 50 cal had incendiary rounds yep 
And the thing about this particular bulldozer is it had like one of those digger hooks on the back. Mm -hmm. And with where he had the port for the 50 cal, he had to dig the hook down into the ground to give the clearance for the bullet to go by. But he couldn't dig it down enough. And that's probably the only reason why those propane tanks didn't explode. That is another thing you can see Mm -hmm. in the documentary is the... uh, the puffs of smoke from the incendiary rounds because he's shooting and shooting and shooting, but it's just hitting his armor plating. Yeah. After failing at blowing up the propane tanks, and they estimated that there was hundreds of thousands, not hundreds of thousands, but just thousands of gallons, probably hundreds of thousands of gallons of propane in those tanks. Because it was like six tanks or something Mm -hmm. in a row, and I think they said each of them held like 30,000 gallons. They weren't (laughs) weren't all full. Right, but still enough to go boom. But that's still a lot. So they they were evacuating all sorts of stuff around the area, including a senior housing complex that like wasn't super far. Right. So like another situation where if... I'm not a religious person, but if God wanted that to happen, it would have happened. happened. That's a situation where he was like, no, 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 you're going to hurt people, Marv. We're not going to do this. So he was like, well, fuck it. And he started shooting uh, power transformers on the poles instead. Mm -hmm. And he was he was doing some damage to those. But that wasn't too bad of a deal in comparison to if those tanks had gone off. The Colorado State Patrol was like. We're kind of fucked. We've shot over 200 rounds at this. At this point, they've put a flashbang down the exhaust and it's done nothing. And they were like, well, is he going to turn against the people? Or is it just the businesses? Right. They, ha- they It's it's really sh- fucked up how they actually did kind of have to wait it out and see what exactly he was going to do for a little bit there. Allegedly... The governor at the time was considering authorizing a National Guard attack to do, like, a single strike, like, either Apache (laughs) helicopter with Hellfire missiles or, like, a javelin to just take that threat out and be done and over with. Mm -hmm. As of 2011, his uh, political office has vehemently denied that that was ever considered. Maybe. Maybe not. Probably if he was actually, like, killing a bunch of people and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. that would have been considered, but they probably would have had ground forces there first before doing that, and, like, the ground forces would have been like, "Mm, we can't fucking stop this guy. We might need a little bit more powerful shit. (laughs) Right. Ultimately, it was the state patrol that was like, no, 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 he did say he was going to do that, but... They said that he ultimately decided against it because of the potential collateral damage. They basically were like, hey, you know, this could fuck up way more than just that bulldozer. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can do it some other way. Now, the final place that Hemeyer ended up attacking, which I don't believe was the final place on the list. It was just the final place he was able to get was the Gamble store. Mm -hmm. And that was another person that was on the board. The owner of the Gamble store was involved in the hearings that all had to do with the batch plant and everything yeah. through the board. And he was like, all right, so I'm going to tear down this store. And he was trying to be, like, really strategic about it. He was basically just trying to rip down the walls and let the building fall on its own. And what he didn't know is that there was a small basement to the Gamble store. So when he was, he had gotten down the one side or down the front, across the front of the store, and he went to go down the side, mm. and his tracks fell into that basement. And at this point, he witnesses said that there was a lot of white smoke coming from the bulldozer already yeah, at this point. Yeah, he was kind of running this thing, like, to the ground. <laughs> Their thought is that it was overheating, and that's why it stopped. My thought is that he gave up when he realized he was stuck because he got those two tracks and he tried backing up, he tried going forward. He wasn't going it, it, anywhere. It could have been a mix. It probably started to overheat. A lot. And it, then it probably it started like... to. I mean, the radiator had been damaged. People were saying that the engine was leaking before it was failing. And that it. they basically said even if he hadn't been stuck, he wouldn't have gone very far. No. He shut it down, probably said a prayer, stuck his three fifty seven in the roof of his mouth and pulled the trigger. So they heard the one gunshot come from the inside and they were like, well, I think I know what that was. I think we're done here. But. But also, like, they were also know. <laughs> they were also looking at it like, OK, he probably killed himself. 
how long is an appropriate time to wait? Did he put any booby traps in there that we've got to worry about? So this is where the SWAT team comes in with their breaching rounds. Mm -hmm. They used, I I said earlier that I wasn't sure. Ultimately, it was the one flashbang in the exhaust and the two breaching rounds from the SWAT team. They tried the first one and it didn't really do much of anything. So they're like, well... We gotta be a little stronger. With Someone this. got a plasma cutter. <laughs> so they tried the second one, and they went all out with the second one. And it feels bad to laugh, but one of the guys was like, "Well, if he wasn't dead already, he is, he is now." now. <laughs> <laughs> they ended up actually having to get an oxy torch. Yeah, to cut yeah. <laughs> and what they did, I believe, is they cut out where the um, RV air conditioner was. Yeah, that's it. Obviously, they're going to be the thinnest yeah. point. But <laughs> so they they got inside. They found the access hatch that he had used to get in. Mm-hmm. So I'm pretty sure it was just like a locking mechanism on the inside. It was probably just flush on the outside and then like a handle on the inside. And he had it propped up when he was mm-hmm. like going in and out. They didn't end up removing his body from the tank until 2 a.m. the next day. Mm-hmm. Um, they used a crane to get him out. I'm going to make a really bad joke, but homeboy ascended. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we're, oh. we're leaving it in. Fuck I it. hate to laugh, but like... <sighs> I can't say that the police handled this poorly. They had You don't get trained for the, someone building a tank in the I world. don't think the police had anything to do no. with this. They were just... Screwed. We, they had no. You, there was you nothing can't even they get could mad have at them. They the had best, no idea. The best that they could do was what they did. They got yeah. everybody the fuck out of Dodge, right. and that's probably and they almost fucked that up. That's probably a big part of why nobody died. Yeah. Ultimately, um, because I do think that if the, he knew the that times he accidentally that he killed... shot at Cody's mm-hmm. front end loader were not the only times he took shot in the general direction of people. A few people said mm-hmm. that they heard bullets go whizzing past their head. I don't think it was that close no. of a call kind of thing. And at one point, there were some officers that were, like, standing behind some jersey barriers, mm-hmm. which are those, like, angled concrete barriers yeah. that you usually see on the highways. And he had taken some pot shots at those barriers, and I think that was just to get people to back off, and when they didn't back off, he drove towards those barriers. I just think but that his... he didn't want people too close, because he really did not want to hurt anybody. So, like, I think if he knew that he did hurt somebody, I think he would have stopped and given himself up, honestly. So, ultimately, the entire attack was two hours and seven minutes long. It damaged 13 buildings, 11 of which were occupied right up until they, mm. like, right before they got destroyed. But I still think with as slow as he was moving... And, they had time. And they were kind of calling out over the radio, he's going here, he's going uh-huh. here. So if they knew where he was going, they had plenty of time to right. evacuate. And if they knew where he was going, they knew exactly who pissed him off. Yeah. They knew exactly what was going on. As soon as they called out, it's Marv, it's Marv, everybody knew He's going to hit here. He's going to hit here. He's going to hit here. So where he ended up hitting was the town hall, the Sky High newspaper offices, the Gamble's General Store, the Maple Street Builders, the Mountain Parks Electric Company, which is where somebody that was on the board was working Mm -hmm. at the time, the Liberty Savings Bank. Copycat Graphics was like an accident. He was trying to line up to hit the Gamble store and he kind of like fucked them up a little bit. I don't think he was trying to do that. Um, the wall of his former business, which would have been mm-hmm. him getting out, and then the home of the former mayor, which was the Thompson family home. Right. It knocked out natural gas service to town hall and to the concrete plant. Um, he damaged an Excel truck. He destroyed a couple of police cars, I believe. Um, several trees outside some businesses. He totally fucked up the kids' playground over by Town Hall. I don't know why they felt it was relevant to mention that he, like, really he fucked that kids. shit up. The damage was estimated overall to be somewhere around $7 million. Out of that $7 million, roughly $2 million of it was attributed to the damage specifically at the concrete plant. Mm-hmm. And the only payout that they received was $700,000. The money from the sale of his property that Marv had gotten, he had given to his father. 
and his father willed it to Marv's brother and sister, I believe. And his father had died just not too long before all of this happened. Mm -hmm. So there was pretty much no way for them to be able to go after that money Money? for reparations. A lot of people that are defending Hemeyer, which I'm not necessarily defending Hemeyer. I'm not defending his actions. I'm saying I understand why he did what he did. Doesn't mean that it wasn't wrong. Oh, yeah. But a lot of people that are defending him are pretty much saying that he made a point not to really hurt anyone. He, He tried not to hurt anyone. Cody turned around to that and said if he really didn't want to hurt anybody, he would have done this on a weekend when it wasn't busy, when there weren't people in these businesses. And it's like, hmm. He wanted it witnessed, but he didn't want anyone hurt. Exactly. The sheriff's department counters that as well by saying it was kind of sheer dumb luck that nobody got hurt. Yeah. I feel like it's kind of a mixture of both. I am not a religious person, but I'm going to reference God because that is how Marv referenced Mm -hmm. it. In his eyes, he was doing God's plan. And in his eyes, if it wasn't meant to happen... God would make sure it didn't happen. He didn't get that propane tank blown up, which would have killed so many fucking people. Right. Even with everybody pushed back, it would have killed so many people. Mm -hmm. He didn't get that one big explosion to happen. Was it God's plan? Was it fate? It's whatever you believe in. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, nobody got hurt. It It was never meant to be... Well, except for that dude, you know, (laughs) Cody fucking bouncing his dome off of... Nobody got hurt unless it was out of their own stupidity. Ultimately, uh, yeah. And there's there's a lot more research on this that can be done. Mm -hmm. There's a lot better information on this than what I presented with you today. But we're sharing a brain cell. Yeah. And I'm trying really, really hard. To stay focused. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. That was the story of Marvin Hemeyer Mm -hmm. and his Kamatsu tank, also known as the Killdozer. I did really good. (laughs) You did really good. I think we only said it like four times between us. I don't know. I didn't And it was talking about the media. But so, you know, take your own opinions on this. Everyone's going to have their own opinions. But I think just kind of take the bigger picture of it. Right. And think about that. Not, you know, a man that very clearly just kind of snapped and was tired of everything. I I can 100% see through all the research that I did mm-hmm. how he reached that breaking point, yep. though. I can understand it. I'm not saying that what he did was right at no. all. It was not right. It was not good. It was, it was pretty lucky that nobody got hurt, but mm-hmm. I feel like fate wanted it that way. But it shows that you can have yeah. a really down-to-earth, you know, sane person break and not want to harm anybody but just wanted to you know for one day in 2004 granby colorado was like the most popular thing on the news for one day for one day and now they're just not (laughs) because you know what happened the next day Mm -hmm. i'm pretty sure it was the day reagan died and that's all that they cared about at that point (laughs) so i'm gonna let marv in this episode yeah Okay. Take it away, Mars. Hey, I hope you all have a great time and good life. I've had a great life. We'll see you later.